This is going to give us an opportunity to hear a wonderful talk by Jeff Smith, who I don't really need to introduce and take cut into his time because you heard him introduce himself uh, in the previous session. But he's the director of the Center for Technology, Innovation, and Entrepreneurship at Mount Sinai and professor of uh, health evidence and policy. Jeff is going to speak today about uh, innovation as a process. That will be followed by a panel that um, will be uh, moderated by um, me and Maryam Jahanshahi, and will involve uh, Dean Nicholas Jones, uh, Professor Smith, and Ross Kagan. Uh, Dr. Kagan will replace Elazir on the uh, on the panel. So Jeff, wherever you are, you can't see much from up here. I'm, I'm hiding back. Oh, there you are. <laughs> All right. Well, if you're not sick of hearing me yet, you are definitely going to be sick of hearing from me before the end of today. It's good when you get that last minute uh, invitation to speak because it's hard to get nervous because you didn't realize you were going to be up here. Um, So I gave a speech to the uh, Medical Student Research Day uh, earlier this week, and uh, I didn't have this slide. Um, and it's sort of interesting. You know, it didn't even occur to me that you know, I ought to have a slide up there about financial interest or disclosure. It was particularly ironic because the talk was about the FDA and how I thought we should do away with it. And I suppose for certain of my companies, uh, they might benefit from not having a regulator. Uh, but I stole the idea for the slide from George Church from Harvard. So I am the founder of ABV, which is an early stage venture capital firm. And arrayed around there are uh, our portfolio companies, all of which I have a financial interest in. None of which, however, have much of anything to do with what I'm going to talk about today, um, which has to do with innovation and teaching. So in creating this uh, Center for Technology, Innovation, and Entrepreneurship here uh, at Mount Sinai, what I think a lot about is cutting across typical disciplines. So if you look at the big circle up there that says biological sciences, you know, that's what schools like Mount Sinai focus on. However, when one thinks about the last panel and what is necessary to get a biologic insight from your lab out into the market, to do translational science, you actually have to think about a whole range of other things. You have to think about how you're going to finance it, how are you going to manage the project, what are your intellectual property concerns, uh, what are the regulatory concerns, ethics, am I disclosing properly, um, and a full range of engineering concerns that come up through the technology development process. And so what we'll be developing over time here at Mount Sinai is a much more uh, integrated set of teaching tools to provide both students and faculty access and training in these other areas, uh, these areas that need to intersect with biological sciences so that we can do a better job of moving our technologies out into the marketplace. And so in talking about technology development and innovation, there are a lot of different scale or scope that you can think about uh, to do that. Um, but I'm going to start at a big scale, and I'm going to start at a big scale a long time ago. So I want to go back to a time before life had emerged on Earth. And the lifeless Earth was dominated um, in that sort of prehistorical time by a handful of basic molecules, ammonia, methane, water, carbon dioxide, some amino acids, and other simple organic compounds. And each of these molecules was capable of a finite series of transformations and exchanges with other molecules in the primordial soup. So methane and oxygen could recombine to form formaldehyde and water, for example. And if you think of those initial molecules and then imagine all the potential new combinations that could form spontaneously simply by those molecules bouncing around into each other, Given enough time, you could end up triggering all the combinations that make up the building blocks of life. The proteins that form the boundaries of cells, sugar molecules, crucial nucleic acids, and so on. But what you could not trigger via those first order combinations are chemical reactions that would create more complex organisms, a cockroach or a rose or a human brain. 
And so a biologist named Stuart Kaufman uh, coined a memorable phrase, which was then popularized by a science writer named Stephen Johnson, um, for these first order combinations. They called these first order combinations the adjacent possible. And what the phrase captures is both the limit and the creative potential of change and innovation. The adjacent possible is, you can think of it a little bit like a shadow future. It's hovering just on the edge of the present state of where things are today. And it's a map, in some ways, of all the ways that we could reinvent the present today. But it's not an infinite space. It's not a totally open playing field, right? The number of potential first-order reactions is big, but it's not infinite. And what it tells us then, the adjacent possible, is that at any moment, the world is capable of doing extraordinary change. But only certain extraordinary change can happen. But as you explore, as you do your science, you open doors. And if you pick the door on the right, you create one addition set, additional set of adjacent possibilities. On the other hand, if you pick the door on the left, you create another and different set of adjacent possibilities. And this is somewhat how we go through life opening doors, which expose new opportunity, which allow us to move into that next potential set of adjacent uh, innovation. So the question is, is the ability to open these doors and expand the adjacent possible an innate talent? You know, everybody has that friend who they think, boy, she's really creative. And then I looked at myself and I said, I didn't get that gene. And the question is, did I not get that gene, or did I just not learn the process? And so, as with most things, talent helps, for sure. But innovation is, in fact, a skill. And it is a process. And it's something that can be taught in a structured manner. And I've recently launched a course here at Mount Sinai called the QED Project. There are probably some poor, benighted students who are in the class or out there in the audience. And we have to hear some things that they've already heard. Uh, but what the course sets out to do is just that, to teach innovation as a process. And so thinking about a structured process for identifying and inventing technology-based solution involves three phases. You need to identify a need. You need to invent your technology-based solution. And then you need to implement the solution. Today I'm going to talk very briefly about identifying a need. I'm not going to talk about implementation at all, but I'm going to spend a few minutes thinking about the invention phase of that three-step process. And so the first part of this is thinking about um, needs finding. And actually, the uh, process described is really when you're starting from scratch. Clean sheet of paper, new team, brand new. And for the new team, the first thing you actually have to think about is what is it we're doing? What are our strengths and weaknesses as a team? How are we going to set a, a group of criteria that determine whether or not we want to pursue a given problem? And so there are a whole bunch of steps in that process. But coming out of that, you would have defined a strategic focus for your team. And the next step, then, is to identify a problem um, and then a need. And this is a sequential and iterative process. So first, you have to go out and observe. And whether that's observing in your lab or that's going out in more of an anthropologic method and observing what's going on in a given business setting or whatever it may be, you need to observe. And you need to spend a lot of time observing uh, in real world situations to begin to figure out what the challenges at hand are. And then you need to identify the problem that's inherent in the situation. And we define a problem as a recurring situation in which doubt, uncertainty, or difficulty is met in the process you're observing. And finally, you then need to reshape that problem into a need. And what we mean by that is to identify the change in outcome that is required to address a need. The change in outcome. The change in outcome is the innovation. Innovation is the change. And what you actually have to do is write it down. You actually have to write down everything in this whole process. But it's really, really important to write down the need statement, the statement that describes the change that we're looking for. So let's give an example. You observe a problem. You go out and you uh, decide to go to the ICU and you want to spend time looking around the ICU to see if there are any areas of doubt, uncertainty, or difficulty. And you notice that a lot of patients who have long-term urinary catheters are getting infections. So now we need to write a need statement. 
what is the need statement? And since I wasn't supposed to give this talk, and I usually give this talk as part of a class, I'm going to call on somebody. Scott, write a need statement. Patients in the ICU, catheter in place, lots of infections. What is the need? A safer, infection-free way to empty patients' All right. A safer, infection-free way to empty patients' bladders. See, that's what a big thinker says. I would have said, gee, we need a catheter that doesn't create infections. <laughs> and if I had written that down, we need a catheter that doesn't track infection, that would have created one set of adjacent possibilities. All those possibilities would have been bounded by the catheter, right? That would be the technology that I would be focused on. Now, if I'd gotten that creative gene, I might have answered with Scott's answer, which is a different way to evacuate the bladder in order to avoid infection. Well, now I have lots of opportunity open to me. My adjacent possibility could be a better catheter. It could be a depot of an antibiotic. It could be some non-catheter-based solution. All kinds of different ideas come forward. So what you write down, what you define as the need that you're going to address creates the technology opportunity for you, creates the adjacent possible set of things to move into. And so this is a very critical and important step in this innovation process. And then we go on to build off the need statement. And we take on a variety of analyses to help us determine if a given need is, in fact, one that we really want to pursue. So we do a gap analysis. We look at all the potential technologies for avoiding the bladder. We look at all technologies related to infection. And we begin to build a map to show us where there are gaps in the current state of care that could be solved by different technology solutions. We draw a different map. We look at every stakeholder involved in this process. So you can look at a clinical level. Nurses are involved. Doctors are involved. The ICU, the critical care doctor, maybe the primary care doctor. There are a whole bunch of people involved. You could look at it from a hospital administration perspective. Are the infections keeping the, hospital, the patients in the hospital longer? and therefore costing the hospital money, or perhaps making the hospital money. You could look at it from a company perspective. Can I sell more catheters if I do away with infection? You can look at it from the patient perspective. You have to do a very wide-ranging stakeholder analysis to understand all the people who are either going to win or lose based on your invention of a new technology. You need to do a market analysis to the extent that you think that this is something that you want to pursue commercially. You can do a top-up analysis or a bottom-down analysis. But having done all these analyses, we go back to our need statement and we draft a need specification. And that's a specification that summarizes in a single document all the various components of this first part of the innovation process. The need statement, what the underlying problem is, all these collateral analyses that we've done, and the criteria necessary for a technology solution to create the change that will solve the problem. What are the acceptance criteria? What are the criteria by which we determine that the technology that we've invented is, in fact, a good one, a good solution? So with that specification in hand, it's now time to invent. And I did forget one part of this portion of the talk. One of the things that you do when you get out there and you talk to people is you're trying to identify you know, problems and all. And so you talk to people, and you need to listen to them. But Henry Ford was famous because he said, well, if I'd gone out and talked to my customers, what they, to what they would have told me they needed was a faster horse. So this is, in fact, where the invention process has to include some creativity, right? You have to listen. You have to synthesize. You have to analyze. You can't just take at face value what everybody's saying to you. Because in part, a lot of what you're hearing is the received wisdom. The reason that we get these catheter problems is because that's how we get urine out of the bladder when the patient's in the ICU. Well, maybe, but maybe there are other ways to deal with it, too. So you have to be very careful as you're going through that process to add some creativity, to add some critical thinking, and not just rely on what you're hearing as the received wisdom. But in any, any event, if you've gotten through all that, it's now time to invent a new technology. And there are three things to work with uh, during the technology invention phase of things. They're facts, they're ideas, and they're solutions. And the natural tendency is to jump from facts to solutions while skipping over the exploration that is at the heart of finding new ideas. 
I've found that scientists are particularly experienced with fact-finding. For the students in the room, I bet you're all awesome at facts. You've written down facts on tests your whole life and done really, really well at it. So I'm pretty comfortable that you can handle the fact phase of things. And we're all pretty good at looking at solutions. We may not always think the solutions are the best that they could be, but we are pretty good at identifying a solution when we see them. But what we're gonna to talk today about is the process of creating new ideas. And you know, very often, this part of things is almost dismissed as being you know, childlike or playful, I'm sketching, I'm thinking, I'm doodling. It's not seen as something that's really as hard and solid as facts or as valuable as a solution. But it should be as important as both of those things, for it's at the heart of this exploration of possibilities that we really need to focus on finding out what is possible, what is adjacent to our current reality. So Tom Kelly is a very uh, famous industrial designer, and what he says is that the devil's advocate may be the biggest innovation killer. And we're gonna spend a few minutes trying to unpack this statement and understand why that may be true. So many, if not most, great ideas come into the world a little bit half-baked. It's more of a hunch than a revelation. It's not too often you're sitting in the shower and the light bulb, in fact, goes off and you have that brilliant insight. More likely, you had something kind of itching at you in the back of your mind, and it's been sitting there for a while, and you haven't quite been able to connect it somewhere. And this is why genuine insight is hard to come by. It usually takes the shape first in this partial incomplete form. I kind of have this hazy notion, but it's not all there. And very often, the missing element that you need to get to that light bulb going off is in somebody else's brain. It's somewhere else out there in the network, and you need to connect to it. And so we need to create environments where those partial ideas can connect. And usually this takes place slowly over time, right? You go to a conference, you talk to somebody, it begins to fill in, you read a paper, you go back, you do some more experimentation, you think more, you call your friend. And the hardest thing is that while all that's happening, life is going on. So you're answering the urgent email from your boss and you're getting distracted by some committee you were asked to be on or the keynote speaker doesn't show up and so you're forced to jump in and give a talk you weren't planning to. Whatever it is that disrupts you from keeping focus on that initial hunch that may be the core to some really great idea. So innovation is in part a design problem. Can you design a system that allows you to keep your slow hunches alive long enough that you can cultivate them into an innovation? But it's also a design problem in the sense that you can design a process that allows you to generate more ideas. And this is on the theory that quantity will eventually produce quality. And that's what we're gonna spend today talking about. It's how do we follow a structured process to generate ideas? Um, so this uh, notion is called brainstorming. And when you say that, people look at you and typically walk out of the room because it's gotten kind of a negative connotation to it. Anybody who reads the Dilbert comic strip probably knows why it's got a negative connotation to it. Uh, but it's actually uh, an important tool. It's not the answer to all things, but it's a tool, and it's a tool I would encourage you to try to use as I'm about to describe it because I do think that it can help in this process of inventing new ideas. And in response to Tom Kelly, one of the key elements of the approach is that it requires participants to temporarily suspend their instinct to criticize new ideas. And instead, it forces you to be open to a rapid flow of new possibilities and connections. So you have to suspend criticism. That's something that most of us in this room probably are very poor at. We're great critics, but we're actually not very good when it comes to just going with the flow, think about the new idea, how many new ideas can we generate? What else might we think about? Do we know who that is? Anybody know who that is? Edison. Thank you. Thomas Edison, right? So Edison made it clear that inventing is in fact a discipline process that involves patient and hard work, right? So this is his famous quote. None of my inventions came by accident. I see a worthwhile need to be met, and I make trial after trial until it comes. And then this is the part that everybody always remembers. What it boils down to is 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. But it's the middle sentence there. I see a need to be met, and I make trial after trial until it comes. So he saw the need to invent the light bulb, 
and he needed a filament. How many filaments did Edison try before he hit on the one that worked? Ross, how many? Order of magnitude? Seven. Seven. Scott? Fifty. John? Thousands. thousands. Thousands, plural. He tried thousands of filaments, which of course means what? He failed thousands of times before he found the filament that actually went into his commercial light bulb. And what's interesting about this is that we all hold up Edison as this individual icon, right? I mean, he is the inventor. But what he really was was part of a multidisciplinary team of innovators that worked out of Menlo Park as a group. And he knew that the quantity of idea was as important uh, to getting to the right answer as the light bulb going off, and that the failure of many of these potential solutions was inevitable. And that's where our critical nature comes to be a problem. You have to fail, hopefully not thousands of times, but you have to be open to having enough ideas that some number of them, whether it's six of the seven or 49 of the 50 or 2,999 of the 3,000 can fail so that you eventually get to the right answer. So I want to give you four broad themes to think about when we're thinking about generating ideas. And the first one is that ideation at this stage in the innovation process, remember it's a process. We've gone through a whole process to identify a need, write down a need statement, create a specification, create a set of criteria that are going to allow our need to move ahead. And now we need a very specific mindset that is different from any other required during the portion of our innovation process. Because everywhere else in the process, we're going to be highly critical. We're going to be highly analytical. We're going to do gap analysis and market analysis and engineering analysis. But right now, we're not. We're just going to open our minds. We are going to put the critical filter aside for a moment. And we're going to set all of our preconceived notions aside for a moment. So whether you think that this idea is possible or impossible doesn't really matter just now. All that matters right now is that the idea is new. And at this point, perfect is the enemy of idea generation. So even if you think the idea isn't quite right, we still need it. Then the second thing we need to do is cross-pollinate. So there are abundant opportunities to look across specialties, to adapt technologies from one area to another. But we talked about silos earlier today. And what very often happens is people go into their silo, and they talk to people in their silo. And that's great, because you have a shorthand, then, a shorthand way of speaking. There's lots of stuff you don't have to cover. right? So if you're sitting in there and you're working with your Alzheimer's research buddies, you can talk to them in shorthand, because you're all kind of doing the same thing. But the problem is it gives you one very small view of the world. And if we're trying to generate a lot of new ideas, and we're trying to get out beyond the norm, then we need other people. We need an engineer, or a computer scientist, or a business person, or an industrial designer, people who are going to think differently. So one of the things I find with scientists is that they all tend to label. They're very good at labeling. So people say to me, well, you know, you're not a scientist. You really wouldn't understand. Or almost worse, they say, I'm a scientist. This is the way I think, as if to say they can no longer think in any other way. And that's part of this problem. We have to be more open to cross-cutting across different disciplines. That's a stage, because we have to apply this methodology at different stages of the innovation process. So we may apply the the, this uh, methodology to come up with a new solution, invent the technology we're developing. We may then want to use it later to figure out how to market it. We may want to use it to figure out how to make our team work more effectively as a team. We may want to uh, design an improvement in the function of the technology, so we may want to come back to using this. We have to use it repetitively, and we have to use it iteratively in a feedback loop so that you may need to repeat the brainstorming ideation process around your technology again and again at each stage of the process, again, to make sure that you're covering all the range of possibilities available to you. So here are the rules. So remember, the purpose of idea generation is to push the innovation process forward toward the final goal of one good idea and one good development strategy to support that idea. And with that goal in mind, and keeping in mind those four themes I just noted, here's an example 
uh, of a very structured way to go about running a brainstorming meeting. These rules were largely developed a very successful product design firm called IDEO. And they uh, posit that the key to all of this, and, and I disagree with them a little bit, but they posit that a facilitator needs to be chosen to run the session. And that the facilitator is the person who's going to enforce all these rules that we're going through. And they posit that the facilitator actually best off is not somebody involved in the team that's actually working to develop the new technology. My experience has been that that actually can be sort of artificial, and then you get these facilitators who decide that they're all powerful and they can actually stem the idea of flow. So you have to be a little bit careful with all of these things. They're more guidelines than rules. But let's go through them. So the first thing we need to do is to defer judgment. So we're going to get together in a room. We're going to have our team. Hopefully, it's going to be cross-disciplinary. We're going to give ourselves a set period of time, and we're going to start to generate ideas. And the first thing that happens is you start to throw ideas, and somebody says something really silly, and you stop, and you scoff at them. And in fact, when I ran this uh, exercise in a class the other day, this started, and the first person to scoff at somebody was me. So just proving that uh, one ought to be careful about listening too closely to your teachers. But you need to suspend your critical thoughts and commentary until later. So accept any new idea and move on quickly to the next uh, concept. And you need to think about the interaction in that room. So if you have a very strong-willed boss who tends to be domineering, who's not going to be open to this process, then you maybe don't want to invite him or her to your meeting. You want people in the room who have bought in. They're going to come into the room. They're not going to be judgmental. They're going to get ideas out onto the table. And you're going to encourage them to have wild ideas. So not only are we not going to be critical, we want to push to think in new and different ways. We're going to filter the ideas later, so you get plenty of time to deal with that. But right now, you want to get as out there as you can. Because very often, a good idea may be hiding just next to your crazy, goofy idea. So get them all out onto the table. You want to build on the ideas of others. So this rule is complementary to number one. This is the rule of no buts, only ands. You don't say, Ross, that was a dumb idea, but let me give you a good one. You say, Scott, that was great, and let me build on it by saying. And you actually have to force yourself to use that type of language. You have to force yourself to say, building on Scott's idea, what if? Because this is a way to enhance his idea without being critical of him, which brings him into the conversation which gets more ideas out of him. If I say, Ross, that's a dumb idea, but let me give you a good one, Ross probably stops participating for the rest of the day, and that's a failure. So you want to carefully build on the ideas of others. You want to go for quantity. So usually these sessions last 60 to 90 minutes. And you want to set a goal for how many new ideas can we generate in 60 to 90 minutes. 100 new ideas in the next 60 minutes. Go. We actually did this in class the other day. It was pretty impressive. I think in 15 minutes, we generated about 40 or 50 ideas out of a pretty big group of folks. But it's very important to set some kind of target for yourself because you want to force the pace. You want to avoid dwelling on any single idea at this stage of things. You just want to get volume. One conversation at a time, right? This is what the facilitator does. If people are off whispering in the corner, the facilitator is supposed to say, hey, come on, come back, pay attention. Stay focused on the topic. When you're doing this kind of exercise, all kinds of things may come out, some of which may actually not be that relevant to the technology you're really trying to focus on. So you need a whiteboard over in the corner where you write down ideas that are interesting but not on topic, and you can come back to them later. But you have to force yourself to remain focused on the topic at hand. And you want to be visual. So you actually want to put these things in some way that everybody can see the ideas as they're being generated. So you're writing them on the whiteboard. You're uh, projecting them on a screen. But somehow, you need somebody who's capturing the ideas and putting them out there for the, for the group to see. And what the real power of this brainstorming uh, process is, is that it leverages a group of cross-functional contributors that all hopefully have different perspectives. They're seeking to solve a problem. And you're not just looking to a single expert or group of experts for a solution. And I think that's actually one of the most important things about this. It's that ideation in and of itself is valuable. Forcing yourself to go with your team, to sit in a room, to come up with 100 new ideas in and of itself is a valuable exercise. 
I can tell you as venture capitalists, new technologies come to us all the time. And what do we do? We call up Ross, because he's an expert. We say, hey, Ross, I'm interested in this thing. What do you think? And Ross gives me his opinion, and I write it down. And then I call up Scott, and I get his opinion, because he's an expert in the field, and I write it down. And after I've talked to three thought leaders, I'm good. And I go off and make my investment decision. And you know, maybe that's OK for venture capital, although given how unsuccessful we've been of late, maybe not. But what's important here is not to accept the received wisdom. Get outside the received wisdom. Don't just accept what the core of your field is saying. How can you broaden out to think about what else may be possible to you? And all I've described here is a tool. It's a process tool that's supposed to help you get outside that every day and broaden your set of adjacent possibilities. So it may sound a little kindergarten-y to you. It may sound like, eh, why would I want to waste my time doing that? But I promise if you do it, you'll be surprised. You'll be surprised at the volume of ideas that you can generate, and you'll be surprised at the connections that may come up that you wouldn't have thought of by yourself. Now remember, though, partly what you're also doing is looking to connect the hunch. Because you do have that good idea. It's been sitting in the back of your mind, or you've been looking at your data and haven't quite been able to get out of it what you have a sense may be a good idea. You want to connect that slow process to this fast process. And in doing so, you'll open up a range of new possibilities for yourself. So here's an example of a real uh, brainstorming session that led to a venture-backed company. The need was a less invasive method to reduce weight in morbidly obese patients. They generated a bunch of ideas, which they then organized into these categories in green. And the specific ideas they generated are sitting around the outside. So this is actually a real map. So out of this brainstorming session, you've generated 100 ideas. You then map them. Here, they've mapped it by sort of mechanism of action of the technology solution. And what they uh, ended up focusing on was to reduce volume in the stomach. So they came up with a way of placating the stomach, sort of folding it in on itself and tacking it in a smaller format. And they went out and raised a lot of money and actually now have taken this idea into uh, clinical trials. So I wouldn't argue that this brainstorming is perfect for all things, but there are a lot of good examples of coming up with a lot of ideas, mapping them, and then going out and seeing what you can develop. Because it's out at that edge of the map where you make connections, where you generate new adjacent possibilities, and where you open the opportunity to be more innovative. So thanks for letting me pinch hit for Elazar. I hope he'll be here tomorrow because he's a super speaker. And I will turn it back over to John.